everyone. Uh, I'm Audrey Coleman. I'm Associate Director of the Dole Institute, and I'm so pleased to be with you here today. Um, this is our third installment of our Living History series, our new digital history or digital media series uh, featuring leaders from flagship institutions all around the country. Uh, we're hearing about their work and why it matters now and during this historical, uh, unprecedented time, as, as we say. Um, today, I'm so pleased to have with us Joseph Jones, who is the Executive Director of the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement. It's on the campus of Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, Joseph, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for your time. Hi, Audrey. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited that you reached out and wanted to talk to us about our work. Yeah, well, there's been so many exciting things going on in Iowa, weather notwithstanding. Uh, <laughs> but just this past July, you all, um, you were you recognized a major commemoration that we actually have in common. So would you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. So uh, back on July 26, the um, 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act occurred. And of course, we recognize that as a huge piece of civil rights legislation for people with disabilities across the United States. And um, of course, Senator Dole and Senator Harkin had a great deal to do with that legislation and to getting it pushed uh, past the goal line. So it was great to be able to celebrate that uh, in conjunction with others like the Kennedy Institute and the Bush Presidential Library um, to talk about the importance of protecting the rights of people with disabilities. Um, that legislation you know, only passed 30 years ago, like I said, and it's amazing how much has occurred um, in the lives of people with disabilities in our country in that 30 years. Of course, we recognize that there's a lot more work to do, but um, it was a great time to take a step back and really commemorate the importance of that legislation and celebrate the anniversary. Yeah. So um, Senator Dole and Senator Harkin worked together in the late 80s and early 90s to, to get ADA passed. And I was noticing in, in some research I did recently that um, in 1993, the two of them co-sponsored a, a bill that would uh, have encouraged the State Department, the US State Department to uh, assess uh, each country uh, where we had uh, diplomatic relations with for um, you know, making sure that they were bringing themselves up to standard uh, that we have here in the United States for, for disability rights. So uh, really cool to see their name uh, coexist on that piece of legislation. Yeah, and it's a great partnership. Uh, it was one of those prime examples of good bipartisan work and, and how people with different uh, political ideologies can come together and work on things. And I, I think that they still do see that as a, a great accomplishment on their part, but they also saw it as the right thing to do. And they were more than happy to work on it together. And um, I think what you saw come out of that and still exists to this day is a good friendship between the two of them. Um, and so uh, it's a great example for those of us who work in public policy to, to follow and, and watch as it continues to blossom as a friendship, um, having worked on that common piece of legislation together. Yeah. So you are just right up the road in Des Moines. And would you tell us a little bit about how the Harkin Institute came about and how long have you guys been around? Yeah, absolutely. So when Senator Harkin announced that he was going to retire from the Senate, um, it was discussed that there needed to be a place to, um, to put his papers, and which you can appreciate. Uh, and so there became this decision of, of archiving all of his papers. And um, he'd spent 10 years in the House and 30 years in the Senate representing Iowa. And so we really didn't want that um, legacy to um, fall just to history. We wanted to be able to actively work on some of the issues that were still important to him uh, during his time in Congress. And so the Institute was established uh, after the archives um, were um, established. And um, we moved to Drake University in the spring of 2013. And really it was decided then that the Institute would work as a think tank where we would do some research and we'd help fund some research on projects uh, in those policy areas that Senator Harkin really held, held dear. And of course, after 40 years in Congress, uh, a member can have you know dozens or even scores of uh, projects and, and policy areas in which they're interested. So we really had to focus on four. Um, people with disabilities uh, is an obvious one, uh, labor and employment, retirement security, and wellness and nutrition. Um, and those four areas really became our, our focus in terms of our research and in several of our uh, programmatic events. But in addition to that, we also 
um, support people coming to the archives and doing research, um, which I know that y'all do quite a bit as well. Um, and we'd love for people to be able to access that history and access those records and, and really dig deep into uh, some of the policy issues. Um, we also want to make a point to uh, connect people with policy. That's our tagline. So we want the general public to understand um, how different public policies work, um, how to engage government and other policymakers in decision making uh, using good information. And we've tried to provide an opportunity for students on Drake's campus to uh, explore a little bit of public policy and provide them with an opportunity to be exposed to some elected leaders and other leaders across the country. Well, that fits very well with your own background because you have your, your you have, you worked for Senator Harkin, is that right? You have your own, right. you, you know how the process works, you've seen it play out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I was a, a Senate intern at one point, and um, I worked uh, for Senator Harkin uh, both in official capacity, and I even uh, worked on a couple of campaigns through a uh, coordinated campaign effort. And, and so I've gotten to see the, the different aspects of this. Um, and I, I think our entire staff, our entire team really appreciates uh, getting young people exposed to, to government and public service, um, having spent a lot of our own uh, career paths going through the same sorts of things that the students are about to embark on. So it provides for a good opportunity to mentor, um, but also gives us hope that the, there is a generation coming up that really is excited about public service and wanting to get involved and make the country and make the world a better place. So uh, I definitely use my experiences and my background on a daily basis and my interactions both with the, the public and the faculty on campus, but also with our students. Well, being from the great state of Iowa, you all have huge influence on our, our political processes and who gets <laughs> nominated and, and uh, things go down the road. Do you get involved in the Iowa caucuses or do you help students get connected uh, to that activity? Or Sure. Well, Drake's campus is really uh, ideal for, for caucus time. Um, the students are uh, heavily involved in, in Republican and Democrat uh, campaigns and they um, have an opportunity to be exposed to the candidates and they, they keep lists and they keep um, stacks of photos uh, in their electronic photo albums of all the candidates they've met. And it's really interesting how much exposure they can get. I um, don't spend so much time doing it as, as I used to. Um, I definitely give uh, advice and I talk to folks about campaigns, but I really spend a lot of time talking about process. Uh, having worked for um, the Iowa Democratic Party for a while, I've worked with my Republican um, Party um, counterparts um, in preserving uh, the caucuses being first and, and helping people to understand the process itself because, you know, it's a, a foreign concept to some people. How does the Iowa caucus work? And um, just the idea that people will go into a room with their neighbors and talk about politics for a couple hours on a Monday night um, is not necessarily a normal thing to do. And so, um, I really have spent more of my time talking about that and the, the importance of people just sharing in general how they feel about policy issues and about um, politics. You mentioned the, the B word bipartisanship there in your last response. How do you incorporate bipartisanship at, at the, um, the Public Policy Center? Sure. So at the Institute, um, we consider ourselves nonpartisan and we don't work on any particular partisan issues or we don't lobby or things like that. But what we do is we provide an opportunity for people to have um, discussions um, in an environment where their positions are heard and understood and people can exchange ideas and people can agree to disagree and, and talk about what the impacts of policy can be. And so um, it is not uncommon for us to have students of all political stripes uh, work at the Harkin Institute and individuals come to our events uh, who come from um, all parts of the political spectrum and, and many of our presenters um, and um, sponsors of programs come from different backgrounds and views, but they all have in common is that they want to see um, improved lives and they wanna see justice for people who come from marginalized communities and they wanna to work together on things that will help progress um, the momentum of things in our country. And so um, we try to provide that opportunity for folks. Mm -hmm. Well, if, as we were chatting earlier, and as I understand it, so while you're doing these wonderful things and engaging students, you also are undergoing a 
challenging project, I would say, in that you're opening, a, designing and opening a building here one of these days. Is that right? That's right. So um, a little over a year ago, we started working in earnest on um, a new um, building for the Harkin Institute. And as we've been um, going through this process, it's really been uh, a great collaborative effort uh, with our construction team, our architect team, um, our furniture and landscape architect team to not only make it a place that uh, takes a lot of green building standards into place where we are concerned about making sure that we have um, an environmental footprint that is one that we can um, say upholds our values, but also we wanted to create the most accessible building we could think of. Uh, of course, with Senator Harkin's work on the ADA and our focus on people with disabilities and disability policy, we wanted to make sure that anyone who came to our building felt like they could access it easily, um, that they were welcome there, um, and that there was no um, barrier to them to be able to come in and really enjoy um, both the archival displays, but also the programs that were happening in there. And so we started working on um, going beyond even what's considered universal design in some ways uh, in building our, our building. And we're really excited about um, the construction path that we've been on. Uh, even with pandemic happening, uh, we've been able to keep the construction going. Um, one of the most obvious features that people will notice uh, even driving by the building is um, has a lot of natural light. And it has a ramp that is the main conveyance from the first floor to the second floor. So everyone takes the ramp. Um, there, there are no stairs for the, the public to take. And um, I think that is a really great uh, practical use, but also a good symbol that we can all um, move along together without the barrier of the stairs. And so that's a prominent feature in the design of the building itself. So the building is slated to open this fall and we're really excited about it. Uh, not sure what that's gonna look like in uh, the COVID environment to have any sort of grand opening or ribbon cutting, but um, we are excited to, to have it completed and be able to make that the new home of the Harkin Institute. Mm. It'll be so exciting to see that one of these yeah. months, sooner or later, can't wait to come well, visit. It's a short drive, you should just come on up. Yeah, yeah, you guys, you guys made the, the trip in a day, I think, a few years <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> So Joseph, what, um, what are you doing this fall as far as programming? How are you kind of adapting to the COVID environment and, and, and how are you able to keep doing what you're doing? Sure, so our research continues um, that we've been doing uh, both with our staff and our research fellows and um, everyone's able to do that uh, remotely and they can collaborate uh, using all kinds of great systems online. Um, as far as our outward facing programming goes, um, most of that has uh, moved or all of that has moved to being online and being virtual. And so uh, we will continue to do some of the, what we would call the, the highlights programming that we do throughout the year. So we have um, a major lecture that happens every semester called the Sussman Lecture. Um, and so we have one in the fall and one in the spring. And so we, we know that the spring one will happen next month and that'll be announced soon who that speaker will be. And we're really excited about that. Um, and we also have a annual event called the Harkin International Disability Employment Summit which brings together corporations and microenterprises, governments, academics, um, funders to talk about the state of employment for people with disabilities around the world. And so we try to have this global conference each year where we, we try to give good ideas and, and best practices to each other on uh, ways that we can move the needle on employment for people with disabilities into integrated competitive employment is what we call it. And so. Um, of course, this year will be virtual, so we'll have people from dozens of countries uh, all log in and be a part of that uh, event uh, this fall. And so um, in this environment, we want to continue providing people with information and providing them with high-quality programming, but we also recognize that not being able to do it in person um, puts a different twist on things. And so I think we've been able to um, figure out a way to pivot to make it impactful still, even though we can't do it in person. Well, that's so nice that um, you have that opportunity to go international and, and really uh, follow in, in that spirit and, and of policy development ac across the globe, not just for Americans traveling abroad, but for everyone living uh, here in the world and, and having similar opportunities. Yeah, it's really great. And it's been, um, it's been comforting to, to meet kindred spirits around the world who, who want to work on the same sort of issues and are doing the same um, work in other parts of the country or other parts of the world and in, in their countries. And so 
um, putting people together a couple times a year to talk about what we're doing and to provide resources and, and good ideas to each other has been really invaluable. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so I have, I have one more question for you, Joseph, and then you can uh, volley any at me or, 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 or add anything that you might have uh, forgotten that I didn't prompt you to say. But <laughs> as executive director of the Hargan Institute, what are some of, your, what are, what are some of the, the goals that you have, uh, near term or long term? What would you like to see? Where would you sure. like to see the Hargan Institute in a few years? Well, you know, we're a relatively new organization, so we're still growing. Um, we're, we're both uh, growing our uh, endowment and our staff, and we're working on more and more projects, so developing partnerships um, to do more quality research that we can disseminate out um, is one of my goals uh, as part of that growth. Um, of course, this building coming to fruition and being completed is a huge goal um, to, uh, to get marked off a list and so we can get up and running there, but I think that one of the other things will, will be a expansion of some of the things we're currently doing. So we, we provide a scholarship to Drake students who have a financial need um, who are going to DC to intern, for instance. And so um, we recognize that not everyone can afford to have a low paid or unpaid internship on Capitol Hill. Um, and so one of the ways that we, we try to mitigate that is we provide scholarships for students to have transportation to DC and housing while they're there so they can get the experience that they need for their career. So I'd like to see that program expand a little bit and so we can provide more scholarships. Um, and I, I see some of our research uh, expanding in the, in the future. Uh, I'm not sure how far into the future, but those four policy areas might extend to six or seven, uh, depending on what the, um, the climate is and based on more of Senator Harkin's past work. So um, education and um, early childhood education, particularly. Uh, I think agriculture would be one of those. Child labor would be one of those. So there's some other things out there that we have some really um, deep archival material on and of course some background for Senator Harkin's work. Um, so I can see that being a part of that as well. In the short term, there's definitely a lot of intersection um, between our issues that we can work on now along with how people who are affected uh, by COVID uh, fall into those categories as well. So how are people with disabilities affected uh, in this environment? Um, what have we learned now about um, healthcare and food insecurity for people and how that affects their general health um, in this environment? And so I think that uh, we'll be able to uh, use some of these current experiences to provide uh, even more real-time and relevant information. So much wonderful work to be done. Yeah, there's always something to do and uh, never a shortage of uh, ideas out there for us. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Joseph. If, if folks wanted to follow up with the Harkin Institute or follow what you're go what's going on with you all, how would they do it? Sure, they can go to the website. It's harkininstitute.org, H-A-R-K-I-N institute.org, um, or they can just Google the Harkin Institute and uh, hopefully we'll pop up. Uh, and they can uh, visit uh, there and sign on to our newsletter or look at our events page um, and even look at some um, information that's posted there or on our Facebook uh, or any of our other social media websites where they can look uh, past programs uh, and other things that are out there. There's some really neat things, particularly from the 30th anniversary. There's a whole lot of um, programs and activities that are out there. One that I would particularly mention is Senator Harkin went uh, on an airplane flight with a uh, a lady named Jessica Cox, and Jessica was born without arms, and she's a pilot. Um, and so um, it's some really great uh, video footage of their time in the plane together. So that's one that I definitely recommend as well. Joseph, it's so wonderful to, to count you as a colleague and friend. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and tell us about your, your work at the Harkin Institute. You as well, Audrey. I appreciate your time and I appreciate you thinking of us and reaching out. And I hope that your programming is going to go well this year as well. You guys have a lot of things planned. Thank you. Yeah, we've got a, we're, we've moved our program slate to, to the virtual platform. So like you, uh, we're, we're, we're being flexible and, and innovating and, and looking forward to all the good and new things that that, that brings and the, the, new, the new perspectives that we can have. Right. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have a lot of lessons learned on how all these things worked out and, and how we might incorporate them into our uh, new normal whenever that gets to be. Yeah, the, the thing. absolutely. It's a, it's a chance to innovate, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs>
Well, thank you, Joseph, again. And, and thank you all uh, to you folks watching us from the Dole Institute side. Appreciate your interest in this series and we look forward to seeing you virtually at the Dole Institute very soon. Take care. Thank you.